Hi friends, uh, welcome back to Coffee with Ravi. Today my post is about how to prevent colon cancer. As you know, this is a topic that is important to us. Uh, it comprises about a large body of work we do and uh, March actually also happens to be Colon Cancer Awareness Month. What I want to go through today is what are basic risk factors, in other words, things that put people at higher risk and average risk for colon cancer, what are strategies available, what are preventive strategies to prevent even colon polyps and colon cancer, and we'll touch upon some of this so that you get some more insight about colon cancer. So the lifetime risk of getting colon cancer is about 4%, which is a reasonable risk. That's why we spend some time trying to kind of understand this risk and how to prevent it. Colorectal cancer is higher in males than in females. I know some of you ask me this question. It's also there's some racial uh, uh, and ethnic uh, um, differences. African Americans seem to have a higher percentage of colon cancer. There's been a gradual shift towards colon cancer that's on the right side and there's a number of reasons for that. So therefore right side of the colon and when you're talking about the colon this the rectum, the sigmoid colon on the left side, the, trans, uh, the descending colon, the transverse colon, and then the ascending colon and the cecum. So the right side means on the right side of the colon, on the right side of the body. Colon cancer is uncommon when there are no predisposing genetic factors before the age of 50 and starts increasing between the age of 40 to 50. A good thing is because of how uh, effective United States is relative to the rest of the world, United States has one of the highest survival rates from colon cancer. So here are some risk factors uh, for colon cancer. The, the, there are some hereditary syndromes such as hereditary familial polyposis, Lynch syndrome, and uh, these are two syndromes. Uh, in addition to others where there are some they come with a genetic cluster of other cancers too such as stomach endometrial ovary small bowel hepatobiliary etc so other cancers seem to be clustered with colon cancer these are very uncommon um, patients who have personal history of fa uh, colon cancer or family history of colon cancer that is not the family history has to be early or if they have family history of colon polyps that are advanced. Advanced meaning they have to be a size greater than one centimeter. They have to be of a particular type on examination. If th those are risk factors in the family, one's own risk factors then go up. If one has had prior history of colon cancer, their own risk for colon cancer into that own lifetime is higher. Also, if one has history of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's affecting the colon, the risk seems to be going up, and especially it goes up after eight to 10 years, especially if there's diffuse colitis. Other risk factors include pelvic radiation at a younger age. If somebody has pelvic radiation at a younger age, it seems like it goes up. Cystic fibrosis can put you at higher risk. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, we talked about that. Last year, the United States Preventive Service Task Force changed the age of to where we should start looking for colon cancer from 50 to 45. So therefore, 45 is the new 50, and I think that's one of the themes of this discussion. There are some risk factors that are also up there where the, and this doesn't change when we start, but patients with diabetes, obesity, red meat, tobacco use uh, and, more, and moderate alcohol use, which I have up on the slide, all of these seem to be risk factors that push towards formation of polyps and colon cancer. Here are some protective factors. Physical activity, diet uh, with increased fruits and vegetables. I always tell our patients, eat a, eat a diet that has different colors, you know, kale, spinach, beets, carrots, nuts, berries. These are low glycemic fruits, these are uh, low glycemic vegetables and there seems to be some antioxidant protective effect not just by increasing the fiber but other new, mic micro and macronutrients that get in that way. There's some minor uh, benefit from calcium and dairy products 
and take and making sure that one has enough vitamin D or sun exposure. And in our climate, I think taking some supplemental vitamin D uh, uh, is uh, always a helpful thing. This discussion would not be complete without the benefits of screening, of course, which is to prevent colon cancer. Colon cancer goes through this pathway where there is polyps that are formed. The polyps then, over a period of time, accumulate enough genetic mutations to become colon cancer. So therefore, if you take and find polyps and eradicate them, and I'm talking about people who are at average risk, people who have these higher risk conditions such as Crohn's or uh, Lynch syndrome or familial adenomatous polyposis, I've thrown out these words, where there is extra risk, that's a different cup of tea. But people who are average risk go through this polyp to cancer sequence. And if you find polyps, you can take them out. There are some harms associated with screening. The harms include sometimes, you know, the, even though colonoscopy in general is safe, there's also always some minor risk associated with any procedure. Sometimes when we do these tests like FIT tests or Cologuard, sometimes when they uh, come back positive, they generate some anxiety because they are not the most specific tests. And of course, there's the uh, cost effectiveness of each approach. So here's some assessment of risk. How do we assess our risk? So ask yourself, do you have personal history of adenomatous polyps? Not any kind of polyps because they're different varieties. There's a type of polyps called hyperplastic, which are not, which don't really put you at risk. Or do you have history of colon cancer? Do you have family members with colon cancer or advanced polyps? What was the age of diagnosis of the family member? Do they have any other colon other outside colon cancer uh, clusters that put you at risk for these genetic syndromes does one have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis has there been radiation to the pelvis at a younger age or at any age that puts you at risk the age to start screening is at the age of 45 that's what we are following in our practice that's what United States Preventive Service Task Force and the gastroenterology societies uh, uh, recommend when to discontinue screening in other words when do we stop it's recommended that we continue screening through the age of 75 between 75 to 85 if there has been no previous screening the determination of whether to start screening for colon cancer needs to take into account what is the life expect expectancy at that point is there any comorbidity and what's the test that has to be used for patients from 75 to 85 who've had prior history of polyps, also we need to take into account the patient's preference, prior testing results, the comorbidity, and in general, a rule of thumb is if there's a life expectancy of less than 10 years, I think there would be limited benefit from screening for colon cancer. With that in mind, how do we choose a test? The four tests that are in general available uh, are colonoscopy, the, the stool fit test, the multi-target stool DNA testing, which is marketed as Cologuard and CT colography. But here's the thing, CT colography I would take out. The, the best test is colonoscopy. And here's, uh, there's a slide that's gonna follow, which I'm gonna show. The best test is one that the patient is able to do in a safe way. But if you're looking at it from the standpoint of finding polyps and finding colon cancer, Colonoscopy is the best, as the slide will show you. If there are polyps that are less than five millimeters, five to 10 millimeters and greater than 10 millimeters, and then there's colon cancer, the colonoscopy can pick up these polyps at the rates of 70 to 80%. Whereas the stool fit test is lower on all these measures. And Cologuard is high on colon cancer, but on the smaller polyps or, or any polyps, it's lower. CT colography is in general used as a backup, so therefore I think I would take that out of the discussion. So it'd be either the what's marketed as Cologuard or the FIT test or the colonoscopy, but really the summary seems to be colonoscopy would be kind of a one-shot fits all kind of a thing, but, the, but obviously it's a little more invasive. And beyond that, the second best at that point uh, appears to be Cologuard. So I would, I would, I would uh, encourage you to spend some time with the the slides uh, which is the sensitivity and specificity and it's a little busy slide though but it gives you a sense if, if the bars are all high and uh, th that's 
tells you that it's both a good test in terms of if there's polyps that we're finding it, if there's cancer we're finding it, but and as you can see, uh, uh, to pick up cancer, uh, all of these are okay. You know, in other words, they're high, but that's a little bit too late. That you know that that we're we're trying to put out the fire before it starts. And from that perspective, it'd be the colonoscopy followed by uh, the stool DNA tests. Uh, uh, and perhaps then the fit test. Uh, uh, the, in the slide, they talk about sigmoidoscopy, which is the partial colonoscopy, but that we no longer really even recommend. So therefore, in summary, please think about risk factors. Please think about how to prevent colon cancer and what are those preventative things that we are talking about, which include, you know, control of obesity, control, of, you know, eating a diet that's plant-rich, eating less of red meat, avoiding smoking, and moderating alcohol. All of these seem to be helpful along with uh, periodic uh, uh, screening tests, uh, which may include colonoscopy, fit testing, or stool colocard. So thank you for joining us today, and we'll continue to talk about uh, topics that are of importance to you.